Speak, God, we're listening. Plant your word down deep in us. Please speak, God, we're listening. Please show us the way. Amen. Well, it is a joy to be here with you. And uh, I was kidding. People said, is your service going to be a little bit longer than you've been used to for a few weeks? And I said, I'm an old man. I can't go more than an hour. <laughs> but this is communion Sunday. And so bear with us. Of all of the verses, of all the scriptures to start with, the lectionary gives us the story of Job. And we do live in a Job world. The beginning of the story was that there was once a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright. And he feared God and he turned away from evil. It begins almost like a, a, a fairy tale, once upon a time quality to it. But this story rings so true because we know about suffering and innocent suffering everywhere, near and far. Something happens in this story of Job that would make any onlooker ask why. And eventually it asks even Job and, and he asks himself, why me? But I think even more, it, it, it raises the question, how can God allow such suffering? The story begins very much with Job intact. Everything was great. In that first verse, or first chapter, you, you read about Job's life prior to his sufferings. He seems to have it all, and especially a proper attitude toward God. But then he loses everything, and it begins with his children, his possessions, and then finally his own health. At first, in today's lesson, you realize that he maintains his faith, and throughout the book, he gradually loses his grip and, and begins to complain. Who could blame him, right? But he never loses his integrity. Job's friends come to comfort him. And it's a great comfort at first because they don't say anything. <laughs> they just sit with him, which is sometimes the proper thing to do <laughs> when somebody's really suffering. But then, well, then they start discussing why he might be suffering. And they begin to be more judgmental than caring. They argue back and forth. Certainly Job's suffering has to have some root in his own sinfulness. But Job defends his integrity and wants to plead his case with God. So if you want to get a glimpse of the full story of Job, um, we're going to be looking at a few of the texts in the, the weeks to come. And he finally does have his audience with God. And, and uh, I guess <laughs> he doesn't really say much to God, but he listens and it changes him profoundly. It's a rather one-sided conversation, as you'll see, but, and I wouldn't exactly say it's a warm and fuzzy conversation. <laughs> It's more like a cross-examination, but it's enough. It's enough for Job. He, he gets put in his place in a new way, and his place is in a new way. It ends up, the, the, the book of Job ends up with everything being restored. And so, you know, from the classic definitions between comedy and tragedy, this is a comedy. There's not, nothing funny about it but it has a good ending. That's the way you define comedy versus tragedy in literature. In the end, we might not have definitive answers about the problem of suffering in the world. It might be that we won't understand God's role in that, all that clearly. 
as opposed to our own role and what we do to ourselves and our world. But what we do know, as we repeatedly see in salvation history, is that where suffering is, that's where you'll find God. And, I would say, God-like people. So for those looking to be faithful to God, the best place for us will be joining those in the, in the midst of, of suffering, especially innocent suffering. So, when I read Job, especially these early chapters, I gotta tell you, I scratch my head a little. Uh, what happened to the rainbow? Now, you remember the story of another really righteous man in the scriptures, all the way back into Genesis. Uh, God chose Noah, remember? And, and Noah, although Noah had a vehicle of grace and, and, and safety for his family before the great flood. And, and Noah was able to take not only his family, but all creatures, as we hear, you know, by two, so that they would be saved from certain extinction. Well, what happened to the rainbow? Because when those waters stopped, that, that flood in Genesis, and the waters receded, and, and dry land was available again, God said to Noah, look up in the sky. In Genesis 9, he says, God says, I have set my bow in the skies, the rainbow. And, and that's going to be a sign for me and for you, a covenant, that I'll never do this again to the world. I'll remember my covenant every time we see the rainbow in the sky. But what happened to that rainbow promise for Job? You know? It seems that everything that could possibly have gone wrong has gone wrong. Children destroyed, possessions gone, and even as today's lesson suggests, loathsome sores on his body. I don't use that word very often, so I had to look it up. Disgusting. Disgusting sores were on his body. But the most shocking thing for me was that conversation between the Lord and what one translation calls the accuser, what our lesson today called Satan. Now this is not the Satan later in history. The Satan that is really connected to hell. This is more or less a, I don't want to even say a fallen angel, because I wouldn't say that that might be some of the tradition, but this is somebody that's got an audience with God, this, this Satan at this particular passage. And one day, and I'm reading now from the message translation, just to remind you, when the angels came to report to God, Satan also showed up and singled, God singled out Satan and said, what, were you, what have you been up to? <laughs> and Satan said, well, I've been going here and there, checking things out. And then God said to Satan, have you noticed my friend Job? There's no one quite like him, is there? Honest and true to his word, totally devoted to God, hating evil. He still has a firm grip on his integrity. You tried to trick me, God's saying to Satan. You tried to trick me into destroying him, but it didn't work. And then this accuser says, well, let me attack his body and just see. You watch how quickly he'll curse you. And so God says, very well, he's in your power. Spare his life. The final thing in this episode of the bad things happening to a good person is that Job even loses the support of his wife. These disgusting sores must have gotten to her. And, and she said, do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. And of course, if that had happened, her life would be basically so insecure. So she was actually 
saying, it's got to be over for the both of us. Because women certainly didn't have much besides their married status and what their husbands provided. Job says, you speak like any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive good from God and not receive evil? And then in all of this, the scripture says, Job didn't sin with his lips. But what happened to the rainbow promise for Job? How can anyone maintain faith with living through those horrific circumstances? When his friends began to, to counsel him, we'll soon learn that with friends like his, who needs enemies? And when I hear that interaction between God and Satan in the beginning, very well, he's in your power, spare his life. I wonder if having a friend like God like that, who needs enemies? I'm not going to stay there, but it makes me wonder. What happens to the rainbow when the skies are so dark and the rains are so heavy that the sun doesn't seem to stand a chance to break through? What happens to the rainbow when fires and smoke begin to engulf a distant mountain and, and that mountain seems to be moving your way? What happens to rainbows when temperatures are so high that people can't find any place to cool down? We do have a word for this kind of setting. It's called dystopia. Dystopia. Could we say that Job was dystopian or on, his, on the way to being dystopian? And that would mean he was a person who imagines or foresees his life and life around him filled with nothing but suffering and injustice. Such a life would be a life without promise, a life without hope, a life without faith, a life without the rainbow. Now today, as we gather around Christ's table, celebrating World Communion, we know all too well that there is suffering and injustice that's very near and very far away. A month or so ago, I uh, saw in our local newspaper, I'm always so proud when I see this kind of stuff, not that I like to read it, but just that we have this kind of coverage. I saw this story, you may have read it, about the hunger crisis in Namibia. Our altar table, as many of you know, our cloth, is a gift from the churches of Namibia to us, the partner churches that we share, partnership with UCC SA congregations in that country. Well, anyhow, this article read that 400 elephants were being slaughtered because of a famine in Namibia, because people were starving. And I thought, you know, when Ann and Nathan and I were in Namibia years ago, we went to, on a safari, and, and one of the beautiful scenes that we saw was a, a watering hole with, with uh, 60 elephants gathered around it. Magnificent, with all the other animals waiting their turn in distance. You don't mess with elephants. And 400 elephants were going to be slaughtered. And I thought, how can this be? And then, then I read on, and it did make a little more sense because the article said these elephants were starving to death as well. They didn't have food to eat. So they would have been destroyed. Now, we're connected to that story, not just because we have a cloth there, but because we know that there are congregations in Namibia, even now, that are doing what we do here in Lancaster, that are feeding hungry people. When we were there visiting them, we saw some of those ministries in action. We're connected to that suffering and glad for that opportunity to know that our sister congregations 
are in their part of the world meeting the suffering that's there. Today is World Communion Sunday, and we're connected to places where there is suffering and injustice. In, in 1999, I was able to be a part of a trip to the Holy Land, led by Bob and Ann Weber. Um, it, was, it was a more peaceful time back then, that there were still lots of, lots of tensions. How were the Palestinians and Jews ever going to live together? How would they ever manage to create a two-state system there? And we even visited Gaza back then. We, I mean, we had to go through a lot of checkpoints to get into Gaza, but we were there at Gaza. And we, we visited with the head of the Red Crescent, which is the equivalent to the Red Cross in our own country. It's hard to see images of Gaza today that are just like bombed out images everywhere. It's hard to listen to arguments on whose blame is it, whose side is the blame. I think one of the most memorable things for me in that Holy Land trip was to see people from both sides of those issues seeking in some ways to be peacemakers. You don't read about that in the papers. No, you just read about who's right and who's wrong and which side are you on. But back then there were women in Jerusalem dressed in black, Jews, Jewish women, dressed in black that were standing in solidarity with what was happening to the Palestinians. And then some years afterwards, in 2006, there was a group that was formed called Combatants for Peace. These had, these had been people on both sides of the conflicts, both the Palestinian side, the, the Arab side, and the Jewish side, and, and they were organizing a memorial service. Not for the dead from their side alone, but from the dead from both sides. And in that first, that first memorial service, back in 2006, a hundred people gathered together. In recent, in recent years, as many as 15,000 people have gathered in those memorial services, the more Memorial Day service, rather than one side only being remembered, the loss, both sides grieving. Today is World Communion Sunday, and we're connected to places where there's suffering and injustice. That's what the crop walk's about, folks. The crop walk is, a, is about providing food for people around the world. It's also about helping refugees. Refugees that are becoming because their land is no longer livable. The conflicts are so bad. We know that climate change explains a lot of this problem. Extreme weather events, North Carolina mountains. I don't know what you saw on, on various internet feeds, but I saw flooding in biblical proportions. When we went to Vermont last month, we were driving up through Connecticut and on the Housatonic, we crossed the Housatonic River, which I used to fish it when I was a seminary. I loved fishing there. And, and a few weeks before that, I had seen on the national news the Housatonic flooding and cars being floating down the river in Connecticut. What happens to the rainbow promise? One of the most disturbing thoughts for me is I see these dystopian scenes is uh, that people may start to see Mother Nature as an enemy. And then, in addition to that, begin to question even the dependability and the loving nature of God. And those of us that are gathered, worshiping God, praising God, following the example of Jesus, need to be able to connect people to a hope rather than a scapegoating. They're the problem. 
nature's the problem or God's the problem. I believe there's a much better way than to curse God and die. Walter Brueggemann, and I love Walter Brueggemann, has some tremendous insights to share. And from the beginning of Job's story, um, Brueggemann thinks that what Job really needs is a, a good conversational partner, <laughs> not one like his friends. He needed somebody to talk with him. And that day will come, it will come, when he finally has his audience with God. And God shows him a world that is connected in so many ways. But in the meantime, I want to end with something that Thomas Friedman said in, in a book called Thank You for Being Late. And he was getting ready to write about Mother Nature. And uh, he said, before taking out my blank sheet of paper, I, I did one vitally important thing. I looked for a mentor. And then it dawned on me. I, I knew a person with the most experience absorbing climate changes and retaining resilience and continuing to flourish. I, the answer came easily. I, I knew a woman who had been doing that for 3.8 billion years and her name was Mother Nature. Mother Nature is going to be able to respond to whatever climate crisis occurs and push away all that destruction so that new life can begin. We just need to know how to be that resilient, that persistent, and that connected to the fact that where there is suffering and death, there can be new life. And we need to be looking for that new life. So what happened to the rainbow if we are listening for God's word and our deepest needs and if we seek to learn sustainable lessons from the natural world, we can find ourselves connected again to the covenant that God has promised our world and all of life within it. And someday, <laughs> as that little green frog used to sing, you know the little green frog, right? Hermit, the rainbow connection, the lovers, the dreamers, and me. Amen.